Today we'll be talking about a bacterial infection of the lungs that can have devastating consequences. In the case of this 62-year-old contractor named Victor, an appropriate treatment plan failed simply because it wasn't implemented. Victor was reluctantly brought to the ER one morning by a construction worker on one of his building sites who was concerned when he arrived at work looking extremely unwell and seemed to be struggling to breathe. You are a third-year medical student asked to assess this patient, and when the intake nurse hands you his chart, you notice that several of Victor's vital signs are out of the normal range. He's febrile, his heart rate and respiratory rate are elevated, and his blood oxygen saturation was low when he was brought in. But by the time you see him, Victor has been started on supplemental oxygen, and his respiratory rate has come down somewhat. You plan to begin by taking a thorough medical history, but just as you're about to begin, Victor starts to get up and removes his nasal oxygen cannula, telling you he doesn't have time to talk to a student doctor and needs to get back to work. As he speaks, he begins to cough, and you briefly notice some thick greenish sputum on his handkerchief before he puts it back in his pocket. After the coughing fit, you observe that he's breathing rapidly again, looking noticeably pale with a gray bluish undertone to his skin, and you have the impression that this man is acutely ill. You and the nurse help Victor to put his nasal cannula back in place, and once he's breathing more comfortably again, you ask him to tell you a bit more about his work and his life while you both wait for the attending physician to arrive. During the social history, you find out that Victor moved to the United States from Croatia 22 years ago with his wife and their one-year-old twin boys. His desire to provide his children with better opportunities had borne fruit and both of his sons are now in college on the other side of the country. Since his wife passed away four years ago from ovarian cancer, Victor lives alone in a small apartment. He still works 10-hour days on multiple construction projects, but he struggles financially and is unable to afford medical insurance. He's been smoking a pack of cigarettes every day since he was a teenager, and several years ago when his wife forced him to see a doctor about his coughing and shortness of breath, he was told that he suffered from chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD, and that he should try to stop smoking. He'd reduced the number of cigarettes he smoked for a few years, but after his wife died, he went back to his usual one-pack-per-day habit. When the attending physician arrives, Victor admits that he's been sick for about a week now and began having severe chest pain and shortness of breath a couple of days ago. On examination, the physician notes dullness to percussion and decreased breath sounds over the right lower lung field. She also hears crackles and ronchi in that area of the lung during auscultation. The physician thanks you for taking a thorough social history and for handling this patient in such a sensitive and appropriate manner. She then orders several investigations, including a CBC, which shows markedly elevated white blood cells, and a sputum gram stain, which reveals many neutrophils as well as gram-positive diplococci. This gram stain's pattern is consistent with streptococcus pneumoniae, or pneumococcus, one of the most common bacterial causes of pneumonia. Victor's chest x-ray shows lung opacification in the right lower lobe, confirming the clinical diagnosis of lobar pneumonia. Since Victor hasn't been hospitalized recently, he most likely acquired this infection from normal social contact, meaning that his illness falls into the category of community-acquired pneumonia, as opposed to the hospital-acquired pneumonia seen in patients who develop a lung infection during a hospital stay. Bacterial pneumonia most commonly results from a microaspiration event during which bacteria like pneumococcus that transiently colonize the upper airways enter the normally sterile environment of the lungs and then make their way down into the alveoli where they can replicate in the warm, moist environment. The host immune system detects the bacterial invasion and deploys several defense strategies in an attempt to eliminate the bacteria. Neutrophils are recruited and they extravasate, leaving the pulmonary capillaries to enter the alveoli, where they can engulf the bacteria. 
even the type 2 pneumocytes that line the alveoli can act as phagocytes and attempt to eliminate invading pathogens. At the same time, inflammatory mediators are released, causing edema in the alveoli, which alters the blood-air interface and impairs the transfer of gases across it. As an additional component of the inflammatory response, pulmonary capillaries become congested and red blood cells are allowed to leak out into the alveolar spaces. This further impairs gas exchange in the lung. Smokers who suffer from COPD can have many changes in their lungs that predispose them to infections. In emphysema, the underlying lung structure has been damaged as a result of cigarette use resulting in scarring and enlargement of the alveolar spaces. This leads to altered gas exchange, impaired mucociliary clearance, and diminished local inflammatory responses. So not only is there an alteration of the resident bacteria in the airways of smokers, but there's also a reduction in the innate immune clearance of invading microorganisms. Because of this, patients like Victor are at a higher risk of developing bacterial pneumonia. Your attending physician tells you that this patient is lucky to have been brought in when he was. The physician then tells Victor that she'd like to admit him to the hospital to treat his lung infection, but Victor refuses, fearing that the costs of being hospitalized will bankrupt him and force his sons out of college. The physician strongly counsels Victor against this decision, explaining to him that his low oxygen levels are an indicator of very serious disease. She warns him that his decision to refuse further inpatient care may have life-threatening consequences, but he adamantly refuses to stay in the hospital for treatment. So before he leaves, the physician gives him an intramuscular injection of an antibiotic and writes a paper prescription to complete an appropriate oral antibiotic course for Victor's community-acquired pneumonia. She also schedules him for a follow-up appointment for the next morning, but he fails to attend it, and three days later, after several unsuccessful attempts to reach her patient, the attending physician sends a home care nurse to Victor's apartment to check on him. Hours later, you and the attending physician receive notification that Victor was found deceased in bed in his apartment. The antibiotic prescription was lying unfilled on the dressing table beside his bed.